Clint McCollum just started supporting independent tech news directly. If you want to join Clint, become a DTNS member at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, June 27th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. From the shores of Lake Merritt in Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We are going to fill your heads with uh, a way to authenticate you by heartbeat. Uh, we're going to check in on the live with it experiment that Sarah Lane's been doing with the Philips Hue lights. But let's start with a few other tech things you should know. Amazon has partnered with Rite Aid to launch its package pickup service counter in the United States. The service launched on June 27th at 100 Rite Aid locations, which plan and plans to roll out to 1,500 locations by the end of 2019. Amazon is also in talks with other U.S. retailers to expand the program. Counter operates under the Amazon Hub umbrella, which includes Amazon lockers for package pickup. Counter launched in the U.K. last month with in partnership with Next. There's a Rite Aid right around the corner from me that uses this, so I'm hoping that this becomes part of the, mm. the deal. <laughs> Mozilla announced Firefox Preview, a pilot of its new Android browser and powered by Mozilla's Gecko View engine, said to replace the current Firefox Android app this fall, but developers can download it from Google Play or anybody who just wants to tinker around early. Mike, uh, Microsoft Mozilla also put its privacy and performance-based Firefox focus for Android development on hold but instead is saying it's going to add focus functionality to Android's main Firefox app. I use focus quite a bit. It's a good privacy app. The Video Electronics Standard Association, you know, Visa, V-E-S-A, Visa Standard Monitors. Come on, 90s computer people, are you with me? They <laughs> announced the DisplayPort 2.0 specification. This provides up to 80 gigabits per second of bandwidth, which supports up to a single 16K HDR 15360 by 8460 display at 60 hertz, 30 bits per pixel, dual two 8K HDR displays at 120 hertz or three 10K displays at 60 hertz. DisplayPort 2.0 will be delivered over the DisplayPort connector or USB-C and incorporate Thunderbolt 3. Visa expects the first devices to use the new standard arriving next year. All right, let's talk a little bit about a smoking, I don't know if it's a gun, but it's something smoking from Huawei. <laughs> Where there's smoke, there's Huawei. Uh, Bloomberg <laughs> reports Thursday that bylines on research papers indicate that Huawei employees worked on at least 10 research projects alongside, alongside Chinese armed forces personnel over the last decade, including projects related to radio communications and artificial intelligence. A spokesman told Reuters, quote, Huawei is not aware of its employees publishing research papers in their individual capacity, end quote. It has all the elements of a classic <laughs> Huawei story. There's a Chinese army conspiracy theory. There's yep. a denial from Huawei. Yep. Uh, there are people doing things that if Huawei and China were not part of the story would likely be considered unremarkable. Uh, it's 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 a veritable classic. And since the, we're talking about it here on DTNS, uh, uh, Tom, chief Huawei apologist, uh, <laughs> please go ahead with your yeah. What I like to do with Huawei stories is say, okay, if I put Cisco and U.S. Army, does it still look weird? That doesn't mean that there isn't anything going on, but it means like maybe this story isn't evidence of what you think might be going on. And this one, I'm like, well, I'm sure researchers at Cisco or AT&T or other places like that do research papers with the U.S. Army. So the fact that employees from Huawei are on research papers that are bylined along with army members itself, if it's outside of China, wouldn't raise an eyebrow. Well, on and the, Huawei, on, Huawei, 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 let me, yeah, just one last thing. On mm -hmm. the other hand, it is in China. And so every link between Huawei and the army gets and deserves a lot more scrutiny. Okay. Well, right. Even if Huawei is like, even if they're telling the truth, Hey, we didn't know this was going on. Okay, well, that's fair. If you want to believe that, is there some sort of policy in place? Are our employees allowed to do this? Sure. If so, I mean, with who? Yeah, I mean, why, but why not? Again, if, if it's not Huawei in China, you wouldn't be like, oh, wait a minute, Cisco. Do you have a policy in place that allows well, your not, researchers to do I, this with the U.S. with DARPA? I, I think, I, but I think. DARPA all the time. 
But I think Cisco might have a policy in place, and that and that and that company, if a story like this came up, might say, uh, "We weren't aware that so and so was doing this, but Cisco does not allow, or Cisco does allow." This is something that you know we have thought about this situation happening already, and we have a policy in place to deal with it in the future, at least I mean, that when it comes to PR. Yeah, but that's what Huawei is saying: is like, "Hey, uh, our our researchers are allowed to do other stuff, and we're not aware of it. It's not." It, it's not our it's not our problem essentially yeah it's just bad timing for huawei i suppose well this is the story this is the thing this is what we have always uh, uh, thought about huawei and whether or not i understand that you are drawing these equivalencies tom and they are good for for us to have a broader understanding but as far as the united states government goes and many other foreign governments this is not the same as Cisco uh, employees freelancing and doing a DARPA project. They feel that this is a sign that there is a communication or, or close cooperation between Huawei and the People's Liberation Army uh, uh, to build uh, uh, products that can have a backdoor for ch the, the nation of China's benefit. Well, and 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 honestly, uh, the my saying this is not that different from what might happen outside of China doesn't mean there isn't any of what you just said going on. It's not yeah. proof uh, that they're innocent of anything either. It's all I'm saying is like, okay, this is some more circumstantial evidence that here is an opportunity where something bad might have happened. It's just not the smoking gun. Nothing to see here. Move along well, not, from Beijing, Bob. There we might be. Know. Huawei just doesn't know if there is or not. Yeah, right. Sure, <laughs> exactly. Elizabeth Lopato has an in-depth analysis on The Verge about why Libra, the proposed cryptocurrency, might not help people without bank accounts. And uh, as we mentioned on last week's show, that's one of the main potential advantages of Libra is to reduce those remittance fees and transfer fees. Uh, here's here's some here's boiled down what what Lopato says. 1.7 billion people don't have bank access worldwide. Half of unbanked adults live in seven countries, and Facebook is banned in one, China, and has been temporarily banned at some point in three others: Pakistan, Indonesia, and Bangladesh. Now that doesn't guarantee Libra wouldn't be let into those countries, since Libra is not tied to Facebook directly. But it's not a good sign. Facebook is probably going to be the lead negotiator for these sorts of things. So it puts them at a bit of a disadvantage. In another of the seven countries, India, Libra would be banned under current cryptocurrency laws. Now, Facebook's trying to change that, but they, they have an uphill road there. Uh, and India is a gargantuan market. So if they couldn't get into India, that would be a big blow. On the plus side, Indonesia, which is one of these seven countries, just legalized trading cryptocurrency. So they've got an easier road there. And they're a pretty big country, too. Lopato also points out that so far, no Libra founding members are based in Asia or Africa, and only one is in Latin America in Argentina. And that's where most of the world's unbanked people are. So that's not a great sign. Also, almost two thirds of unbanked people don't have enough money to open a bank account. and Libra's not going to solve that. About 25% of unbanked respondents said fees were at least part of the reason they don't have bank accounts. That's Libra's main appeal. So they've got a chunk, but not a majority. Uh, and remember, to use Libra, Lapato points out, you have to buy Libra. And the easiest way to buy Libra is to pull money from a bank account or a credit card. So there's some roadblocks into Libra Association being something that is good for the unbanked community in the world, which, in my opinion, is probably one of the best chances for uptake of the Libra Association, Facebook or not. I had a bit of a... Look, I think that there's a lot of good questions that we can have about Libra and and certainly when it comes to uh, affecting the kind of communities that Libra is seeking to affect, we can parse a little bit of how much their the rubber will meet the road versus PR. Uh, however, Facebook is not Libra. Libra is not Facebook. So the first argument, I, I agree with the way that you worded that uh, you know a news piece that in, in summation of the article, I don't know if that's, uh, uh, super compelling. And yes, Facebook is calling Libra a cryptocurrency. We do not know how foreign governments will classify it because it is not a cryptocurrency in the same way that Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. There are technical differences and we'll see exactly how other nations uh, do it. I'm just glad. I, I, I don't know if I would be rushing to throw cold water on something that I think is noble. Uh, uh, the the uh, unbanked world has very often 
been the most revolutionary in creating new ways to transfer wealth between one another. I think having another tool out there makes this a richer playing field and not necessarily, I don't know, to, to, to wonder whether or not w which countries are going to ban it just seems kind of counterproductive to the spirit of this mission. But I think Ms. Lapato's points that, okay, for, for, for those of us, and, and we talked about this when, when Libra was first announced a couple of weeks ago, Hey, you know, the, for, for, uh, emerging markets, uh, and people who have not gone the traditional bank account route, this could be really interesting, especially when you think about everybody who's using WhatsApp and messenger and, and Instagram and, and what, you know, what, what, what is this all going to look like if it all goes forward in six months? Well, it not being used in India, at least at this time. Well, that's interesting because as Tom mentioned, that's a huge, huge community, particularly for WhatsApp users. And yes, if there's if there's this barrier to entry to having a bank account where you could convert to Libra and possibly get some better rates, but the bank account you don't have anyway, and and Libra's not solving that, or at least we haven't heard how the how how the association plans to solve it, it does introduce a lot of questions. Yeah, I, I don't think she Lapato is saying uh, it can't work or it shouldn't work or anything like that. It feels like she's there's, saying there's this some is questions. not going to be as easy as the Libra Association press release was trying to make people think. Well, sure. I mean, if if, if the point is, let's yeah. point out that a press release uh, uh, put forward the product in the best possible light, then I agree. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's, it's her job to point out where that press release is ignoring the points. So I think she did a good job. Of it. Yeah. Earlier this week on Good Day Internet, and I happened to be out that day, but Carl Heath alerted us to some tweets from a participant in a meeting about Facebook setting up an independent oversight board to let people appeal its moderation decisions. Sounds good, right? Thursday, Facebook released findings from six months of work with 650 people in 88 countries. Among the popular proposals were no Facebook members on the board, no removal of board members without clearly defined cause, board power to choose cases, board decisions treated as precedent for future cases, and the power for the board to influence Facebook policies. The company plans to finalize the board's charter in August. So this this was uh, thanks again to Carl for for sending that along. Absolutely, it was, it was good to get the inside scoop on this uh, a couple of days earlier, even before it was confirmed. And it's interesting to see Facebook just say, "Here's what people told us," not "Here's what we're going to do." I think that's smart, uh, Facebook, to get let the reaction be to the suggestions so that they can kind of take the temperature of the room amongst people that are concerned about this. But I I actually really like this idea of saying, "Look." Uh, let's let's create a path where people can appeal their takedowns that we are not involved in. And I think these suggestions are in line with that. I, I applaud these uh, uh, guidelines. I think it's a good step forward. And I would only hope that all of these cases that we are being used that would go forward as effective kind of case law to what should and should not be there moderation wise are posted as publicly and clearly as possible. So at least we can start to build a, a general base on what is good and what is bad. Uh, there will always be content in an infinite uh, a content generator like Facebook that will push up against uh, various uh, rules and regulations. But the best thing we can do is at least have a roadmap. So anything that does come up or down, uh, we'll be able to be judged against something that already happened. Yeah. And, and just a lot of, a lot of transparency about how the roadmap is being built and who is building the roadmap. You know, you yeah. hear the same thing about the Libra Association. You know, yeah, I've got right. friends who are like, Libra Association is just a bunch of VCs and companies that already make a lot of money. Like, what does it matter that Facebook's a minority member of Libra Association? So that that also ties into Facebook not being trusted uh, more often than than late uh, as of late. And it, again, the more transparency, the better. Yeah, agreed. I and also, it's like, why should we trust Facebook? Like, like was it even like? A, a, well, the whole idea is that we don't, right? And no, so that's yeah. why the, I, this I sort of. I think that's what's great about these stories is like, no, we shouldn't trust you, Facebook, but you're doing the things that are acting like we don't trust you. So good. Good for you. I mean, that's like it's like trusting the vending machine. Like, yes, like I, I want the vending machine to vend me a soda, not for me to feel good about the fact that it gave me a soda. Like, if it doesn't work, we should call the repairman. <laughs> it uh, works, but. You also gave up all your private data. But yes, exactly. But it's free soda, <laughs> but now I get targeted ads. Speaking of targeted ads, the New York Times has a report on a company called Alfonso, 
that uses phone microphones to collect data on what TV shows people watch through their microphone. The software runs inside game apps that request permission to use the microphone. This affects app, apps in Google Play and Apple's App Store. Alfonso does line out the collection of its privacy policy and does follow, follow proper OS procedures to request mic access. But I, what I believe is the great conspiracy theory of our modern age, that our phones are listening to us and then serving us ads, is this a one step forward to proving that it is not an urban legend? Indeed, they are. Uh, the, the hills have ears. <laughs> A little bit, a little bit. Uh, the Alfonso does not. Uh, Alfonso says we don't listen to what people say. We're only listening for TV shows and movies to try to give that data to advertisers. And TV shows in particular, they are listening for commercials to say, "Oh, uh, people heard this commercial." Yeah. Uh, and and so and they're doing it right. Although people don't really read the terms of service and the privacy policies closely, they are disclosing it. What may be happening is another service like Alfonso, and there are others that didn't talk to the New York Times, might be listening to conversations, might even put that in their privacy policy and nobody looks at it, uh, in which case then they might be sending that data to an ad bank that might be used by Instagram, which might mean that when you did mention something, it did end up with an ad showing up on Instagram, not because Instagram was listening to you, but because you installed some weird game on your Android phone or your iOS phone from somebody you don't know and didn't pay attention that it asked for mic access when it didn't need it. And that's what's been listening to you, not Instagram. Yeah, the, the, you know, the, this whole kind of paranoia that like Facebook is clearly listening to me because there's just no way that Justin and Sarah had a conversation mm -hmm. that was not recorded and wasn't wasn't d done over, you know, any of Facebook's products. And yet we were served with ads within an hour of having that conversation. Something's got to give here, right? And there have been many theories about, well, you know, it might be the fact that Justin and I have a enough mutual friends and enough mutual friends that are in a certain location and enough mutual friends in that certain location that like a certain thing that it was somewhat coincidental although based on a lot of data points that's not what this is this is this is different and it it's 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 better that people understand that third party apps that aren't necessarily trying to spy on you so that you think facebook is spying on you are actually collecting uh, audio from the room that you're in at the time and that 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 is it's supposed to be to your benefit but more to the company's benefit and you Double. gave them permission to do it and they and, said and it you did policy, yeah. but we all Number know how to one, check which apps have which permissions you should know what these are and now I'm, I'm sure in android that it's easier to do than it's ever been i know for a fact in ios it's easier to do than it's ever been to check which apps have which uh thing if you're like oh i don't know that you know, the farm simulator uh, uh, should have my mic, then revoke its access because it might be doing something weird. And in general, you can never say it too often. If it's free, you're the product. If you're playing an addictive game, then they are going to try to make money on you every single way that they can, either by serving you ads yourself or by these kinds of data scrape, uh, scraping companies that are paying the games to allow them access to your microphone through whatever game that you have downloaded. Also, don't underestimate how good they are at tracking you otherwise. Uh, there was someone talking about this same topic on our on our Daily Tech News Show Facebook group that said, try this, don't say it out loud, just think about something uh, and then go look for ads showing up. Are they reading your mind? Like it may be that they're just really good because of all the tracking they do on you if you don't block any of their tracking of figuring out what you might be interested in. That That is part of this too. Philips Hue now offers Bluetooth built in for its A19 bulbs and also its BR30 floodlight bulbs, which means those bulbs won't require the $60 hub and can be controlled with just a smartphone, the way lots of things with Bluetooth can. Bluetooth has a much shorter connection range, obviously, than Zigbee. That's what connects to the hub. So you can only get about 30 feet away. You also can't control them remotely otherwise. So if you leave the house and think, oh, I'm going to turn the lights off, can't do that because you're not actually connected to the internet. They can be controlled with Amazon and Google's Assistant, but won't work with Apple's HomeKit unless you get that hub. However, they do include Zigbee, 
So Philip says, you can upgrade them with a hub for later if you so desire, even if you don't at the beginning. Prices for the Bluetooth bulbs are $15 per white bulb, $25 per white ambience bulb, and $50 for a color bulb. So how you how you feeling with your Philips Hue? Do you feel bad that you didn't get these Bluetooth versions? Not no. really. I mean, okay. So I've I've got four straight white bulbs, um, and they're I've I've kind of peppered them throughout my house because I'm using another brand as well, and this is something that my live with it segment will will talk about in gr much greater detail when we're when we're done with the three months. But the hub itself was very easy for me to set up. I recognize that not everybody is comfortable plugging things into their router and, you know, going through a few steps and, you know, a little troubleshooting. I didn't have a hard time with that. 60 bucks though, especially if you're like, I don't know, I don't know if I want a smart bulb. I'd like to just maybe buy one and see if it's fun and then think about replacing all the bulbs in my house. And it also depends on, I don't know, how many lamps you have or what your lighting system is. Maybe you're just, you're dipping your toe in. I think this is a great option for someone like that because you don't have to buy this whole system ahead of time. For one bulb and a, and a hub, you might feel like, wow, I'm really paying a lot of money. You know, I'm paying upwards of $100 just for, you know, just to sort of try something out that might not be right for me. And again, the Bluetooth option is limited. You, you, it works like Bluetooth. We all know how Bluetooth works. So it, you know, in the home, it can be great, but it's also limiting, especially if you live somewhere where you can walk 30 feet away and you're still in your own house. So I, I, I don't think the Bluetooth option would have been something that I'm like, oh man, I wish I had this. But again, I didn't have that option at the beginning and I, I've kind of gotten used to this. It's also worth saying that Philips is one of the companies that needs a hub. Not all smart bulbs do. Some smart bulbs already have Bluetooth and and Wi-Fi capabilities built in. So yeah, it's the the ones like LifeX has the Wi-Fi built in that yeah. work really well without a hub. Bluetooth, I don't think is a great uh, way. To I, do it. I, I, yeah, I, I think it's a very good solution. Wait, hold on, let me turn on my. my, my <laughs> uh, 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 I think it's a very very good solution if you have just a few bulbs that are right next to uh, one of these assistants, like a Google assistant or an Amazon assistant, mm -hmm. and you're able to control them right there. It's fixed. Although I will say as having a, a bunch of hue bulbs here in the studio and also in our living room, that the, the, the bridge is actually a fairly good metaphor for somebody who is just getting into IOT devices. I know how to connect to it. It's a very simple connection. I don't have to worry about if I'm in the wrong part of my house because uh, uh, IOT can be finicky in and of itself, uh, having the reliability of just an easy Wi-Fi connection is something that I found helpful. Yeah, I used a Philips bulb without a bridge uh, with the Echo Show with the Amazon Echo Plus that's supposed to act like the hub. Uh, it did not. It did not work well. Uh, so getting the hub really improved the performance uh, of the Philips U. I, th I think that's still the best way to go. MIT Technology Review reports that at the request of the U.S. Special Forces, the Pentagon developed a device called Jetson that can identify people by their unique cardiac signature, their heartbeat, using infrared lasers. Jetson currently works at 200 meters with longer ranges possible if they use better lasers, they think. Uh, according to the Pentagon's technical support office. The device uses laser vibrometry. That's just detecting the vibrations of the surface of your skin caused by the heartbeat. Uh, and that is better than facial recognition because it can work through a shirt or a light jacket, not a winter coat, not big, heavy outerwear. So it might not work in a lot of situations, but if the face is covered, but a light shirt is on, they would still be able to identify who someone is and right now it's up to 95% accuracy under good conditions and takes 30 seconds for a good reading. 95% might sound great, but facial recognition is thought to be still problematic and it's well above 95%. So this still has a ways to go. Jetson was developed from an existing device used to detect structural vibrations and things like wind turbines. And they're like, hey, I bet we could detect even finer vibrations like the heartbeat. In practice, it's expected that Jetson would be used along with facial recognition to kind of provide confirmation of identities. It's similar to something developed by Wen Yao Zhu of the State University of New York at Buffalo, uh, which can only tell from up to 20 meters away, but uses radar. And Zhu's process can measure the shape of your heart as a biometric along with the pattern uh, of your beating. Wow. So, you know, my first reaction is like, all right, if I'm a sniper and I need to wait 30 seconds to make sure that my target is correct, that's not a great thing. 
Well, well, well it, you know, and and the reason okay. my mind goes that way is because we're talking about the, the about the Pentagon. But, but you, you just you just restricted it to the one case of a sniper who has to shoot someone immediately. Sure, uh, well, not well, even all well, snipers uh, have to shoot immediately, right? Please, please. Okay, okay. Well, d d forget the sniper. Something like you know, face ID happens real quick, right? So anything yeah, yeah, that's no, going to take a little bit longer. Not, there's yeah, you, you figure, yeah. okay, well, this you is pretty cool that. technology, but yes, it sounds like supplemental technology yeah. rather I than would, anything. I, I would think about this less like Face ID and more like the machines at TSA. If you have something <laughs> that you absolutely need to make sure that there is no chance that the person who is going to be walking into a facility is not who they say they are, then this is the double, triple, uh, quadruple uh, a version of it. This is something that you can't, fake by having a fingerprint you can't fake by having some uh, a, a duplicate for an iris thing this is inside your body your heartbeat is something that as right now if we are constantly racing to outpace people uh being able to spoof security measures this would be a pretty hard one to spoof well yeah. and i gotta you know i gotta say i you know and i i i wish i'd knew a little bit more about, you know, I, I understand that there are irregular heartbeats and there's arrhythmia and there's heart murmurs and there are certain conditions that can throw things off. I did not realize that your heartbeat besides mostly speed was that unique. Yeah. yeah. It's the, it's the rhythm of it. Cause speed goes up and down, right? When you work sure. out, it goes faster. When you sit, it gets slower. Uh, but there's a rhythm to it. There's, there's a, an amplitude to it. And even the shape of the shape of your heart particularly is, is really distinctive. I can't tell if this, if Jetson is able to tell the shape of the heart, that seems like something yeah. you would need the radar for. It's, it's probably doing, so they developed this technology. It's, it's been around for a while, but they've used it mostly in engineering and in some espionage cases as a microphone. Um, but what's unique about it is that uh, by being able to pick up a person, it's not just about bumping them off. If you're in a hostage situation, you want to make sure you're trying to pick up the right person and not some dummy. It's about identification. It's about yeah. identification. In all kinds and, of and, you know, a lot of what the special forces does is actually just observe and track people. It's not necessarily always about, picking up or, or, or any kind of direct action because you need intelligence. And if you have a high profile target, you want to make sure where they are. Um, if they can get this down, uh, you can actually probably use this in a law enforcement setting as well. If you need to, you need to be on the lookout for a suspect that maybe has eluded custody or something, you might be able to uh, set these up in, in kind of a, um, you know, road, not roadside, but uh, what do they call it? A checkpoint situation. It's kind of it also could be used in medical situations uh, to monitor a person's heartbeat uh, without having to hook them up to wires. Uh, yeah. That could be yeah. extremely beneficial. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, they got to get it faster than 30 seconds, but I, I can imagine corporations wanting to use this if it got cheap enough and easy enough to use so you don't even have to show a badge to walk into your place of work. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of uses this could be put to, and I'm sure there's ways to fake it. I'm very curious to find out how people figure out how to fool this thing too. That's that's always Wear the a puffy like, jacket. Like fully in yeah. a lie detector. Well, no, no, not just wearing a puffy jacket. Like, how do you, you know? fake someone oh. else's heartbeat? I'm I'm very yeah. everything, yeah. everything can be spoofed, but yeah. man. like I know how nervous Justin gets when he walks through these doors. Let me get nervous and then I, I can know. pretend I I'm him. My heart's always a flutter as I try to clear security. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Well, and your rhythm that shouldn't that shouldn't throw it off. But what if you, you know, have a heart attack? That could that could throw off that could change sure. the way. Yeah. Then you uh, gotta go back to heart. facial recognition uh, or maybe the good old thumb. Cardiac arrest. It's the perfect crime. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, big thanks to, uh, let's see, it was DRNXN, uh, Dr. NXN in our, our chat room, who pointed us to a June 27th, 4.50 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time press release, Johnny Ive to form independent design company with Apple as client. Ooh. Apple announced that Sir Johnny Ive will depart the company as an employer later this year to form an independent design company, which will count Apple among its primary clients. While he pursues personal projects, Ive in his new company will continue to work closely on a range of projects with Apple. So they're outsourcing Johnny Ive. Uh, <laughs> this might... That reads like Johnny Ive is leaving and they want to make it not seem like... Oh, no. I... I it was like I, I, a Jimmy Iovine. It doesn't kind even of have to be thing, spin. Right? Uh, it doesn't even have to be spin. This could be Johnny Ive is leaving, and Apple said, 
please let us still use still you. Use your yeah, <laughs> your creative. Well, yeah, that, uh, design like, prowess. How like would we, you like more money to have less work? And also, you can say no when you don't want to work. Johnny, on it. barely ever in the office anymore. We haven't seen you in your white room in years. Uh, but so you, but, you but it's okay it, to go. Well, but it's it'll be interesting to see what else is he going to be working on and what kind of non compete uh, you know, mm -hmm. agreement would he have had to sign, if any? Because yeah. the whole idea was that Johnny Ives, his design went to Apple and Apple alone for quite some time. Well, that oh, could, it could also be a, a form of retirement, which is like, I don't really want to work much anymore. Yeah. So let me just form my own company and you'll be my only client. I mean, we, that, I that think, yeah, easy. he is going to be cashing massive checks from gigantic companies that will want him to design literally whatever he wants. It's like, Johnny, what do you want to design? An escalator. Cool. Here's all <laughs> the money we've ever made. Give us the best escalator on earth. The, uh, the, the position you want is the guy who keeps track of all his NDAs for him. That is job security. Right yeah. There. No, well, I'll tell you what, uh, uh, cheers to Johnny Ive. I'm sure he is uh, uh, somewhere removing his DJ headphones and turning down the bass so he can uh, pour himself a glass of champagne. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. And thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on others at DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. If you have been on Facebook lately, you want a new group and you're not part of ours, facebook.com slash groups slash Daily Tech News Show. And it's time to check out the mailbag. Sure is. So Smith wrote in and said, Tom, Sarah, Roger, and Jury, in yesterday's discussion of an underscreen camera, a, a camera behind the screen of a, of a smartphone, reminded me of hearing a similar item from possibly the buzz out loud days. Apple patented an underscreen camera. Then Smith points us to an Apple Insider article from back in 2009. He says, the obvious use, looking at people during video calls. I rarely use it, but when I do, I'm always bothered by people looking at the screen and not the camera because their eyes are in the wrong place. This would fix that, I'd assume. That's a great call, Smith. Yeah, I mean, we we focused on the technology of it, how, how well the pictures would be, and the fact that it gets rid of notches and bezels, but uh, it does have lots of other effects, this being one of them. And and I think one that would be pretty compelling, certainly in a demonstration, but, but probably something people would like to have in daily life too. Uh, I, I would wonder why they have not gone closer to this uh, yet, that they've gone with notches and bezels. Uh, I assume it's probably more of a, a layout of the phone situation where putting a camera in a position under a screen probably just takes up real estate. Well, if you listen to yesterday's Daily Tech News show, we talk about a lot of the challenges of putting a, uh, a sensor under a screen. Yeah. So. Yeah, Justin. Well, oh, oh, I was saying that to the audience. Here, Sarah. Stop it. <laughs> Okay. Uh, no, we, I wasn't we did, on the show yesterday either. So we did talk about that yesterday, and and the fact that they need they still need software to adapt for glare and haze and yeah. and stuff like that. And we're we're we aren't sure just how good they could make that be yet. So we'll see. It doesn't seem like it'll be that good. I understand that technology can can win over lots of minds, but when I hear about how oh we'll reduce glare and smudging and the whole thing, I'm I'm like, but how? I also I know I um. Uh, part of a very unpopular opinion, but I like my notch. Team notch. You should not be embarrassed about that. I'm not. I know what I like, and notch. I'm I'm not I'm not afraid to say it. Hey, thanks to Justin Robert Young for being with us today. Justin, it's been a bit of a political week. Indeed, it has, Sarah. We have uh, not only debates last night, uh, but also debates tonight uh, emanating from Miami. I'll be live streaming re my reactions as they happen. For both of, or I did last night, and I will again tonight on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Justin R. Young. But thank the Lord that we got so much to make fun of last night, because now I know I at least have something to talk about. This Saturday at the historic Piano Fight Theater, 7 p.m. is when my show, Can I Finish, begins. Uh, uh, I'm going to be making fun of everything that's happened. Man, the, the Mike Gaff. Uh, 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 Beto O'Rourke, Spanish, uh, uh, Jay Inslee, uh, uh, you know, and is, is, is mugging in gift form. It is going to be a great time. And uh, we're not even halfway done yet. We have all the heavy hitters that are going tonight. So go ahead and uh, uh, come on out. Uh, again, it is this Saturday, 7 p.m. in San Francisco, California. Go ahead and get your tickets at bit.ly slash PX number three, June 
Again, that is bit.ly slash PX number three, June. Uh, folks, I am uh, really bad at promotion. Uh, I've been telling you for the last several days that we're real close to the end of the month and we want to hit our goal of one more patron than last month. Uh, and we're now farther than we were three days ago when I told you we need to hit our goal of one more patron than last month. So uh, I'm just not going to bother talking about patreon.com slash DTNS. Instead, I want to mention that Roger Chang uh, guested on This Week in Science with Dr. Kiki uh, this week. Uh, so if you want to get uh, a new angle on our producer, Roger Chang, and of course get some of the best science news you can possibly get, uh, go to twists.org, T-W-I-S dot O-R-G, and check that out. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You got something on your chest? Well, get it off your chest and email us. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Shannon Morse as our guest. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>